All right, this week we have a really nice piece of olive ash. Right then, a rough tone this, which is a while ago now. Um, that's just a case of time to get around to it, right? Uh, it's a piece of olive ash, right? And it's warped, it's actually worked on warping quite badly when it was in the can. We have 10 and 3 quarter across, and we have 11 and a quarter, or just as good as 11 and a quarter. Maybe a little less. Right, that way, so there's a half an inch in it. Right, so the first thing we're gonna have to do is level this off, uh, is level the the tenon off. Sorry, it's my brain isn't working properly today. Um, all right, now you can help yourself uh, doing this. Like I've said this before, that your tenon is going to warp when um, you're off throwing something, right? You should always mark your center because you're going to have to straighten the tenon out All right, and marking your center when you do the rough turn will give you a center point for everything it's basically everything will be running around the same axis in your second turning as it did in the first turning All right, it just makes it a lot easier to do stuff if you just mark and it only takes a second Right. Literally, all you have to do is when the ball is that way, right, and you have to turn in the bottom here, you have to turn in the bottom of your tenon and everything else, just shove your tailstock up, push it into it, and pull it away, and it's marked, right? It's the simplest thing to do, and it really, it will really help, right? It's, it saves a lot of trouble. Right, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, square off this tenon. Right, I'm just going to jam it between the chuck and the tire stock. Just to square that tenon off. Check them clear. Right now. Smaller ball gouge, and just take this. All I'm gonna do is square it up. So I'll take as little as possible as I can off of it so that it goes around. That looks like it's almost it. What, I'm, what you're trying to do here is it'll be oval, right? What you're trying to do is take the the ends of the oval off, but keep the skinniest part there. You see, I'm just touching it there, and I'm just touching it there. So that's it basically done. Right, now I've got to put the... Um, is that one brand, isn't it? What did I You have to bear with me. The dovetail. Anybody's watching the channel for a while knows that this is a modified view. That I have modified the exact size of my jaws, or the exact full part of my jaws. It does make things so easy. I'm completely flat. No, right. Okay, this is something I want you to look at. Right, you see the way it's nice and flat there, but it's slightly different there. That's good, and it's, there's only a touch in it, like, like my nails to where it catches in it, but that's going to set your jaws off. Right, that's not going to sit properly. So just take the time and get this right. 
so that the whole lot is the same level. So the jaws seat, now you see that little lip is gone. Right? The jaws will seat up properly now. You can set yourself up to fail, or you can set yourself up to win. And not having a tent or a harness properly seated is setting yourself up to fail. And there's no point in doing that. quite a pretty bowl and um, when I was cutting it I actually could have got a bigger blank out of this but with something like olive ash right? uh, I'll just, switch, I'll just remind myself to switch to that camera for this bit right? you have dark dark and the rest of it's light if you can get the two of those exactly opposite each other it looks like a better balanced bowl, right? Uh, as far as I remember, when I was cutting this blank, this was slightly off. So I would have had that dark piece over here on one side of the bowl, but I'd sacrificed the extra size to get that as close to middle of the bowl as I could, right? because it just, aesthetically, it's more pleasing. What I'm to do is bring the rim down, and give myself nice clean entries. Way too high. Where the ball goes, give myself nice clean entries there. If you feel, especially if you put me up on this, if you feel safe bringing your tire stock up when you're doing this, and bring your tire stock up. Another cut. This is just the way I do it. Now, something I will say is if the ball was bigger, I'd have the tail stuck up. Right then, now, let's start rounding this off. It'll give me a nice clean entry into there. Whoa, that is well off. Right, now, I'm going to come in the wrong way. I'm going to cut the wrong way here just so I can get the end, just so I can get that rim. Anybody who's been watching the channel for a while knows this is completely normal for me to do. Let's cut the wrong direction until I get that room size. Still a little bit dark. I said it was a habit I picked up years ago and it just still do. Because it was a habit I picked up from doing end grain bowls. I just use the null bowls now. Because it makes it so easy to just to get that edge. Now you start shaping this properly easily in the correct way. getting this round. I'm not worried about finished cuts or finished shape or anything. Mm. 
I need to get a basic round bulb like it's actually funky there as well. Right, you see that section there? Just there. Right? That split was on the outside of this and it seems to be carrying through. So I may have to treat it there. And there's a slight crack there. Right, but there and there. Right, because I don't want to lose that off. Right, I got the pole cut. something and I can actually show it to you now that I think of it. I was actually asked this ages ago and I forgot to, to do it. I mean, I was asked, what's the difference between a pole or shear cut, a shear scrape and the side bevel cut which I will not teach on video as you know. Right. Um, right. The difference actually is uh, it's on the angle of where your gouge is contacting the wood. And how you can tell is by watching the shavings, watching the way the shavings come off. Right. First, I'm gonna do a pole or shear cut, right? right? See the way the shavings. Are coming back that way. Away from the away from the gouge. What's actually happening is right. I'm cutting with that part of the blade, right, at an angle. The shavings are coming down and are firing out here, right? So they're coming that way, right? Because of the angle it's at, right? Now, a sheer scrape, on the other hand, is instead of it being that way, instead of holding the arrows that way, I'm actually turning it so the face is nearly closed. Right. Now you'll see that the shavings are coming the same direction right. because they're being thrown out and because I'm cutting there, right, I'm getting slight shavings. Sometimes you know you get solids with this, but you get really little angel hairs with this, right? But it's been cut in the same place and yet again. The shaving is coming from there. Right? Yet again, the shaving is coming from there, down through the flute, and out here. Right? Oh, the pencil actually marked it, right? So the shaving is coming that way. That's the way it's firing out. Now, the side bevel cut. I'm going to show you the side bevel. Too close for side bevel cut back, but side bevel cut too. Look at what the shade is going straight up. Shave is going straight up. That's because what's happening in the side bevel cut is the shave is coming down and it's coming straight up the other side. Right. It's almost, how could you describe it? It would be almost like if you were using a skew and running along a piece of um, a spindle torn. Right. If you just doing a simple planing cut along a spindle torn. It's the way that 
this long wing is contacting the wood, right? But I hope that's answered that question, is how do you know the difference? And the simplest way is uh, to do with how the shavings are actually leaving the uh, clothes. There we go. We're going to get finished on the outside of this now. little inclusion on this one for a key on the outside if, if you're practicing your uh, your pull or share cuts that's how you know you're doing it right is the direction the shaving is going and if you understand what it's supposed to do on the flute of the gauge Then it's easier to get it in your head. There's a bump in that cover down below. There's the layer. Now this. Right, I'm going to put one finish cut on that there. Let's see how it goes. I need to finish cut down to there. See, this is, this is what I'm trying to keep. Right there. finish cut on this and see if it cleans up if it doesn't I'm gonna have the CA in there which I think I'm probably gonna have to do it anyway this is a side bottom on it going to it if you do a side bevel cut properly you'll actually even get wispier shavings then with the uh, shear scrape So I bevel it's a cut I was taught 30 years ago and that's one I won't teach how to do it um, on video because it can be quite dangerous but if you do it wrong right I'm gonna have to fill that crack because it is not holding Take it off and fill. Can you see the crack just there? I'll take it off and I'll fill the piece out, but I'm gonna leave it on the so I'm just having one of those dice. Choke. I'm going to leave it on the choke. 
anybody's been on the channel a while knows what just happened there. Right. is so small it's just going to be sanded out it's there's, there's basically nothing there it's just it's it's just a mine <laughs> right. it's so small that um, when I'm cutting it I'm actually cutting through the fill that I'm putting into it. There's a chip out of there, which means the rim is going to have to go a little lower. See that little chip there? Right. Rather than leave that in, I'm going to actually lower this bowl to get rid of that. Because that's just ugly. There you go. I lower the bowl. And then I'm going to sand the outside of this. below that crack but I don't want to leave somebody all of you in it quite nice I suppose right I'm going to sand the outside of this and we'll be back in a minute right then let's do the yard show bit uh, from the feedback I'm getting from this piece the uh, most popular thing People seem to like eat yap about doing this and to find out about this bit's about Ireland. So, what I'm going to do in this Yorkshire bit is I'm going to go through a few weird things you can do in Ireland if you come over here. Now, one of them, believe it or not, Ireland has a leprechaun museum. Uh, it's called Leprechaun Museum, but basically what it has in it is it's all uh, stuff to do with Irish myths. Right? And, uh, it's uh, in Dublin. It seems like most visitors are going to go through Dublin or stay in Dublin for a bit or something. It's uh, one of those weird things that you can go and see that uh, unless you know about it, 
and it's somebody's told you about it, you don't really know about it. But it's in uh, a place called Jervis Street. And uh, I said, it's one of those uh, strange ones that unless you know about it, you wouldn't really go. Another one that's up there is right, anybody who's up and done, <coughs> and I was on a bit of Irish history and stuff, always go to the GPL to look for the bullet holes left from the rising. Um, for anybody who doesn't know what the rising is, um, basically, without getting too political, years ago, I'm not going to go modern on this one, totally, because I'm staying out of that. That's a minute. Um, right, years ago, England invaded Ireland and basically occupied the country for hundreds of years. And the rising was from uh, the Irish. Basically, had a civil war against the English. Now, I'm calling it a civil war because. It wasn't Irish foot and Irish, well, it was some, but it, as I said, it gets really complicated. But anyway, it's, uh, it was the start of us getting away from England. And it's still an open wound with certain people. Which is why that when some people who don't know, and they call Ireland part of the UK, we realise Irish people, <coughs> excuse me, we realise Irish people, because we were under the tongue for a long time. Right, but anyway, we get back to what I'm talking about. Uh, everybody goes to the GPO to see the bullets, to see the bullet holes that were left over, if they're into Irish history at all. What an awful lot of people don't know is if you go over to the Daniel O'Connell Monument, which is in O'Connell Street as well, now, O'Connell Street basically has, is a big woods right? And it basically has loads of shops, a road, like an island that runs all the way up, up the middle of the road, another road, and loads more shops. I mean, on that island, up towards O'Connell Bridge, there's a statue called the Daniel O'Connell Monument. And around it, there's four angels. If you go up and actually look, there's bullet holes in those angels as well. It's just, uh, it's one that, another one of those that, unless somebody tells you, you wouldn't know about it. Right, what else is that weird? Right, we go down to Kerry now, right? Okay. 10th, 11th, and 12th of August. There's a town in, Ker in Kerry called Carlargan. And for the 10th, 11th, and 12th of August, the town basically shuts down. Uh, the roads through the town are cut off the traffic. Right, you, there's a way around the town. You come over the bridge and go around the town and stuff. But basically, a goat is put up on a 40 foot high pedestal and treated like a king for three days. And there is basically a party held on the night. Uh, there's uh, a fun fair and there's a joint market the pubs all have exemptions and the place is just thronged it is also the oldest fair in Ireland and if you're around 10th, 11th, 12th August and it's something to experience, I bet you that. It's definitely something to experience if you've never experienced it before. And if you happen to be over here, it would be one to put in your plans. Uh, staying in Kerry. An awful lot of people, when they were coming to Kerry, want to go out see Fungi out in Dingle. Well, I'm afraid to tell everybody, you mightn't have heard, Fungi died. Few years ago, now, Fungi was a dolphin. For those who don't know, 
who had basically taken to swim up side boats and stuff. And he lived in Dingle Harbour. Or around about Dingle Harbour anyway. And was there for years and years and years and years. A whole industry actually came up around him. But I'm afraid he died. A couple of years ago. Uh, another one that's down here, especially for Star Wars fans. There's a place down here called the Skelly Islands. And anybody who watched the last trilogy of Star Wars, uh, where Luke was at the First Jedi Monastery, that was actually filmed on the Skelly Islands. And you can actually go out and visit them. If you fancy. It's an interesting, right? You know, uh, is we put this one off here, right? Uh, just one thing, right? Oliver Plunkett's head. It's the same called Oliver Plunkett. And his head is in a place called Drogheda. It's in Drogheda, George. And you actually go and see it. And it's one of these, uh, what do they call them? Uncorrupted. Uh, so that can be another interesting If you fancy it. Oh, that's pretty. That is pretty. Love the balance in the grind there. Right, you got a better look at the balance one. It's finished. Right then, I'll let that cool off. I'm gonna wax it. And I'll be back then. Right then, here we go to the this. Probably smell off this wood. Take out the rest of this. Only done, so we'll sand and finish the inside of this, and then be back then. So nothing happened in it, so I just had to just keep going with it. Right, so I'm back in that. Let me just put the house for Shane out. Excuse me, and it is quite pretty. That is quite pretty. I would love to get a big chunk of wood that's all that colour. It's all the olive part of this. So, absolutely gorgeous looking well. And yeah, it's quite well balanced as well. As I said, a last size in order to get that balance right. But uh, yeah, I'm quite happy with that. Right then, I'll take it off, flip it over take the base off and then uh, give us a better look at it. So I'll be back in a sec. And there we have it. A very pretty 10.5 by 3.5 olive ash bowl. Now I would say that I lost a good 
two inches off the circumference of that bow in order to get the balance right where the two olive parts are directly opposite each other in the middle rather than off to a side or something like that it's something as toners that we have stuck in our heads sizes every i can do a 14 inch bowl i can do a 16 inch bowl you can do a 14 or 16 inch bowl and if there's something like that and it's hanging off one side or it's if it's if it's not aesthetically pleasing to the eye it's it's not going to be a nice bowl we should think a lot about what the finished piece is going to look like rather than the size first okay for certain pieces yes size comes first for a very busy piece of wood with lots of color and texture and stuff in it yes you can it doesn't matter you go for size every time right or if uh say you get a piece of wood that is big and it's dark but there's some sap wood on one edge that looks really nice but if you get something like this where the sap wood is in the middle and everything else is on the outside if you can kind of line it up it looks better but then again that's my opinion on it right so uh so if you like that one if you wouldn't mind give it a thumbs up and i'll see you in the next one